Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're here on location in Durham, North Carolina. We're joined by Professor Candace Jenkins, Associate Professor of English and African American Studies at the University of Illinois and the author of the fabulous Private Lives, Proper Relations, and Regulating Black Intimacy, University of Minnesota Press. How are you doing, Candace? Great. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for joining us. Uh, there's been a lot of talk recently about an African American male writer, Ta Nehisi Coates, mm -hmm. uh, who's written a memoirish book, mm -hmm. Between the World and Me. Um, and I can't think of another moment where we have talked about a black male nonfiction writer, essayist, mm -hmm. to the extent that folks have talked about Coates. Mm -hmm. um, it's you know really been a long time, you know, really since this kind of moment of Baldwin. Mm -hmm. when a black essayist, black male essayist, has, has attracted the kind of attention that ta, -Nehi, ta has. What do you think that's about? <laughs> well, I think it's about the moment that we're in, right? And that, um, you know, we're in this moment where um, the black body is, is under assault, and that is so much of what Coates is talking about, right, is this um, sense of the black body as fragile in a very particular way. Yeah. Um, and he's talking about the black male body, and I, I'm um, very aware, I'm only about, let's say, three quarters of the way through the book, um, but very aware of his conversation as a gendered conversation, and aware of the critiques that have come out already, um, kind of articulating that and, and calling attention to what he misses in terms of gender, right? But at the same time, I find it incredibly compelling um, and really um, feel that that vulnerability that he talks about yeah. as as something that um, reaches across gender and, and, and speaks and really I mean it's a human vulnerability I mean right. I think that's one of the the pieces of the book that's so important. You know, Tana Hasi has always been an incredible stylist, right? You know, mm -hmm. so we're, you know we're going to read his book for those kinds of reasons, mm -hmm. right? We're academics. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the critiques that we hear all the time about his work in general, but particularly in this book, is that he's writing for a white audience. Mm. You know, what exactly does that mean? <laughs> right, in 2015, what does it mean for a black writer to write around, write around black, write about black bodies mm -hmm. for a white audience? What kind of labor is that really doing? I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that he's writing for a white audience. I mean, he himself has said He's surprised that white people read his work, <laughs> and I, yeah, I don't know how sincere that is or how sort of genuine that surprise is. But at the same time, um, it really does seem that he's he's speaking. I mean, the the, the conceit of the book is, of course, a letter to his son, so, right? right. Um, but he's really, I think, saying some things um, and explaining some things, or sort of sort of speaking things that mean something to a black audience as well, right? right? I mean, that whether or not these are things that a white audience needs to hear, you know, I don't know the, the I don't remember the name of the critic who said, you know, this is essential, like breathing, you know, right. air, or water, right. you know, this, um, reading this text. And I mean, I, I was reading on the plane, I did have that kind of um, really intense response to it in terms of just being um, engrossed by his language, but also by the sort of plainness with which he he makes clear this quagmire that we're in yeah. um, as a nation, um, and and the history of it. I mean, one of the real labors of the book that he does. I mean, the fact that it is it is a book that in which he's writing to his son, right? Mm -hmm. And given all the stereotypes about black men and fathers, right? He's mm -hmm. actually doing some real labor here mm -hmm. around the idea that that he's responsible, that he's connected, yeah. that he's thinking about a large trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, as he did in, to some extent with his first collection of essays and talking about his father Paul, mm -hmm. right, and, and their relationship and the relationship of the of the brother that was also, you know, in the mix. So it, it's fascinating on those kinds of levels. But do you think you know it has the capacity? You know, when we think about the, the cats on the corner, mm. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, and that and that's something that's always a challenge for us as quote unquote thinkers, mm -hmm. as intellectuals, as scholars, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we read ourselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, what do we do to get our work to be able to reach, 
not just a larger audience, uh, you know, the, a, a white buying public, right? Mm -hmm. But but maybe those cats in the corner who aren't going to buy books but might find something in our work compelling. That's such a good question. I mean, I, you know, I I don't know whether. Um, I mean, it's it's it seems to me to be an accessible book um, that anyone might might read and enjoy. Um, I mean, enjoy is such a you know I don't know about it's it's, it's that enjoyable <laughs> to read, but it is um, really moving um, and powerful to read. But I also think there's something to um, his presence in the media, right? That that he is interviewed about this text. He people you know are asking him to talk about it. We're talking about right, it, right? right? That there's a way in which um, he has sort of um, entered the the sort of public discourse about you know what does it mean to talk about race? Can we talk about? I mean, just the metaphors that he uses that I think are going to circulate. Um, you know, this idea of the dream, right? That builds on and plays with this idea of the American dream, but yeah. you know, talks about that dream being built on our bones, and you know, and just this kind of. Um, what that means for thinking about the mythology that circulates around us and how he is really asking us to question that, that I think that's something that can, can translate um, across different kinds of people and different sort of um, spaces that people don't necessarily have to sit down with his book and read it yeah. if the, the ideas of the book are circulating. You yeah. know, there's a way, and you mentioned the kind of, he's clearly writing from a gendered experience, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there's a way, you know, if, if I was a black woman, I, I really do want ta to stay in his lane <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and write about what it means to be a black man raised in a black man, right? You, you know, in some ways you give him a pass for that. But, you know, what will it take for that same kind of narrative that really talks about the experiences of black women to really take hold in the mm. context of, of the public imagination so that we would find that story? Yeah as compelling, right? And, and of course, you know, this, this is connected to the fact that when we look at everything that's happened over the last two or three years, Black Lives Matter, police mm -hmm. killings of black bodies, mm -hmm. you know, the, the narratives that we tend to gravitate to over and over again are these of young black men. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, so Sandra Bland t had a particular hold in our imagination this summer, mm -hmm. but you know we can't recall the names of black women who have died during the same cycle the way that we so easily recall the names mm -hmm. of, of of black men. So true. I mean, well, that's the the importance of something like say her name, where people are right. asking us right. to remember those names, right. to yeah, to, to to think about who are the women who are have been victims of of police violence and how does um, how do their stories sort of fit into our larger narrative and how can we keep their names at the forefront. Um, I, think it's, I think it's difficult because this idea of universalizing the black male experience as the black experience is not a new one. Right, so that what right. Coates is doing um, in, in sort of moving in that direction, or, or even if it's not something that he intends to do, he's read that way, I think, um, by, by many critics, that's not new. That's not something right. that you know, is just happening around his work. Um, and you know, I do think we have to sort of think about, um, you know, what it says about us as a culture, um, and I mean both African American culture, but also American yeah, culture, right. um, that we aren't interested in thinking about women's voices, women's experiences as signals of something larger or something more universal, right, yeah. in the way that we are, men's experiences. Um, and I don't know what it would take for that to change. Um, I think that's a really big question, yeah. You're watching Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're here on location in Durham, North Carolina with Candace Jenkins, professor of English at the University of Illinois. Um, what are you working on these days? I'm working on a project um, that is trying to kind of reconcile the position of the black middle class mm -hmm. in what I had been calling the post-soul moment. Um, Following some of your work, in fact, um, or the post-black moment. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel like we're 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 now in a different moment than whatever <laughs> the sort of post-soul moment was um, in thinking about um, that kind of post-civil rights. I would almost say up until the Obama era, right? And then <laughs> right. you know then we have entered change. a new moment. Right. Um, but so I've, I've, I'm thinking, of course, because I'm writing in this moment, even as I'm thinking about a moment that is really. Um, you know, the sort of 30 years post-civil rights, um, that actually it's, I'm beginning to sort of work with how do we think about um, what I think in this moment is a sort of, as we talked about, increased vulnerability, 
um, around blackness that is visible, right? right? I mean, one of the things right. I try to articulate in the project in thinking about the black middle class is that there is this kind of um, ontological sort of conundrum or, or, or difficulty where that question of the black body's vulnerability is always there at the same time as this kind of covering privilege that happens. Um, and what does that mean? And especially as we move into a moment where the vulnerability is again sort of at the right, forefront, yeah, where I think right. in some of the you know the years in the 80s and and, and early 90s, um, and even into the turn of, of the 21st century, the privilege might have seemed more sort of at the forefront. Um, and yet, you know that what what really is is crucial to me, and I'm trying to sort of tease out in this project and looking at these um, late 20th, early 21st century texts is the conundrum there, that sort of, you know, tension between those two things. You know, it's fascinating because, you know, as, as you just laid out, you know, there's a certain kind of class uh, expansion that occurred within the black community, right? The, mm -hmm. the idea that it, we could get out and have a relative privilege, yeah. at least relative to other black folks. But, you know, this moment of violence against black bodies has, has for lack of a better way to describe it, even the playing field mm -hmm. within blackness, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's much like how we thought about it during segregation, mm -hmm. where no matter what your class alliances were, segregation yeah. kept you back in, in that space. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Kerry Haney, you know, my colleague here, Duke political scientist, you know, he used that, this language about the fact that, you know, even for middle class elites or just straight, you know, middle class black folks in their professional lives, they're also now having to respond to white rage, mm -hmm. right, in response to a black presence, right, mm -hmm. in response mm -hmm. to the visibility of black lives matter, mm -hmm. right, in Absolutely. response to a Confederate flag being taken down. Mm -hmm. uh, and that stuff has real ramifications on the black middle class and their professional lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I mean, and personal lives too. Right. Right. In a, I mean, you know, we're, we're sort of, um, I live in an integrated neighborhood um, and, you know, I have a lot of white neighbors, but also black neighbors. But you know, I'm sort of thinking about this question of, do we put a Black Lives Matter sign <laughs> in our yard? Um, and you know, as as supporters, right? right? But what does that what mean? What does that mean in terms of you know the? I mean, you know, I do have young children. I do have you know not so much an interest in um, covering or hiding my my right. my support for the movement. But what does it mean to? put that out there right. um, and do you let one of your kids wear a t-shirt exactly <laughs> right, just, exactly yes. and and you know in what ways do, do those sorts of things make us targets right, right? Um, at the same time as I think it's a privilege to be able to ask that question right and and to sort of imagine that so in some way without wearing the t-shirt or putting the sign out you're not already a target so, you're not right, already highly right, visible right, right? Um, and there are assumptions being made about you at every moment. So, you know, I do think that, that um, those questions of sort of how to navigate from a position where you may not be on the front lines in certain ways, although you may also be on the front lines, right. but there's, you know, the sort of question of, you know, how do we navigate this in a way that is authentic, right? right. Um, and yet also attentive to safety, I think. Um, which I, you know, I, I think it's, it's a reasonable thing to be concerned about, yeah. right? Um, you know, in terms of thinking about the ways that we're vulnerable. Yeah, so let's take one. You've been watching Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We've been joined today by Professor Candace Jenkins, Associate Professor of English and African American Studies at the University of Illinois. How has the move to Illinois been from, from the big city? It's been wonderful. <laughs> to Urbana. <laughs> it's been wonderful. I mean, I think um, the big city was also a wonderful uh, place to live and work, but um, it's, it's overwhelming. It can get overwhelming, especially yeah. with, with the little with ones. Little ones yeah. yeah, so so we're really happy. and. Um, you know, Illinois has had its struggles in the past year, <laughs> yes. uh, but um, I'm, I'm happy to be there and, and have been enjoying it so far. Well, yeah. thanks for joining us here on Left the Black. Thank you so much for having me. Black lights and booze burn when I record for Watts and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back.